that after the aircraft passed through 10,000 feet, the pilot engaged the autopilot in an IAS or indicated airspeed hold mode in which the autopilot was controlling the airplane to a selected reference airspeed of 320 knots. At about 14,000 feet, the autopilot disconnected. The uh, captain had to then reconnect the autopilot, but in doing so, he brought it up in a different mode from which it was in at the time the autopilot disconnected. Now, instead of controlling to an indicated airspeed, the autopilot was controlling to maintain the rate of climb that the aircraft had at the time the autopilot was re-engaged, and it will do so at all costs, including the sacrifice of airspeed. Now, for whatever reasons, we don't fully understand what the flight crew was doing during this, during this next uh, few minutes, but they were obviously totally unaware as to what was happening to their airspeed and to all of the other correlated indications that were available on the instrument panel. First of all, the airspeed has dropped uh, by now nearly uh, 50 knots. The pitch attitude of the airplane has increased close to five degrees. It's starting to, to nose up uh, quite noticeably. The vertical speed is still registering the same original high vertical speed as when we engaged it. And you can also hear the slipstream sound decreasing as we get slower and slower, the rush of air past the airplane. These are all indications that airspeed is in fact decaying and that there's a problem here. The crew, instead of recognizing a low airspeed problem, felt that they had an engine vibration problem and pulled back the number three engine, which only made the problem even worse because they needed power at that point. The vibration got worse, and so they continued by shutting down the number three engine, and it was only after one minute that they recognized that, in fact, what the problem was is they were in a full stall, 6,000 feet per minute down, 10 degrees nose down pitch attitude, and the airplane was, in, in fact, in a very extreme situation. In fact, it fell 12,000 feet before it recovered. The crew flew blithely on to Miami with huge sections of the control surfaces ripped off in the stall. It's a miracle they survived. The psychologists believe that future developments will continue to edit the human being out of the system. They call it brute force automation and are attempting to head it off by striking up a new balance between man and machine, the electronic cocoon. The idea of the electronic cocoon is to allow the flight crew more freedom to operate as they see fit within the bounds of safety. But the moment that, the, uh, that they exceed the limits of this cocoon, the tolerance limits, or even better, if it's forecast that sometime in the near future they will exceed those limits, then an exception message is put out. And the, the flight crew is told by the computer uh, wait a minute, this is not normal, this is not the way things ought to be going. And now what we've done is to create a dialogue between man and machine, not just uh, a division up of the duties, I'll do this and you do that, we're going to work together. The psychologists are having to improve the relationship between man and machine in exactly the same way that they have dealt with the man-to-man -man problems. But how could such a dialogue work? Suppose the pilot of the near future got himself into an Aeromexico-type stall. Caution, it is not standard operating procedure to use vertical speed hold during climb. If the pilot, perhaps distracted by other tasks, doesn't get the message, the computer might draw his attention to his most important visual clue. Caution, your airspeed is decaying. And only then, if the penny still hasn't dropped, would it spell out to him exactly what needs doing to save the day. Warning, you are about to stall, disengage vertical speed hold, and increase your airspeed. If you prefer pilots to be in control of your next flight, you'd better hope these researchers get somewhere. Because since 80% of all accidents are due to human error, the industry has a drastic way of improving the statistics. There is a very strong feeling on the part, particularly of the engineering community, that the way to get rid of human error is simply to get rid of the pilot. In fact, I've seen a letter from a signed by a senior vice president of maintenance for a major airline, which said precisely that. I don't think that we'll ever see a situation in which we've totally eliminated the human operator or the pilot uh, from, the, from the flight deck, because we need the capability to do what thus far only people can do, and that is to be creative and to deal with ambiguous situations and new situations, unanticipated situations, in creative ways. I have 
an example from the real world that I think vividly illustrates what the human brings to the situation and why we need to design systems so that the human is an integral part of it. Uh, several years ago, a, a large uh, three-engine aircraft was uh, taking off from Los Angeles, and there was a failure in the, in the horizontal stabilizer so that the crew had no control over the pitch attitude of the airplane, a very serious problem. They were able to gain control of the airplane and, in fact, bring it around for a successful landing by making use of the differential thrust between the tail-mounted engine, which is up high above the center of gravity, and when thrust is applied to it, tends to pitch the aircraft down, and the wing-mounted engines, which are below the center of gravity, and when power to them is increased, tend to pitch the aircraft up. Uh, they were able to use that differential thrust in order to maintain control of the pitch attitude of the aircraft, as I said, to complete a successful landing. Now, what makes that interesting is that there is, there's, that's not an explicit or approved or understood procedure. In fact, they made use of an adverse characteristic. Engineers try to design airplanes so that they don't have pitching moments with power changes. Here, a, a human being, a flight crew, was able to make use of an adverse characteristic to save the day. And it's that kind of creative thinking that only the human can do and do effectively that is going to dictate his continued presence for uh, the foreseeable future in any kind of complex uh, system. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. So give it a We're thought the next time you're flying. Are you better right off now, in the hands of a human pilot whose ability to mess it up is at least matched by his instinct for survival? Or is there an alternative? The flight path today is going to take us out directly over Cleveland, then to Chicago. There we go across the Midwest, passing Denver, Colorado, Salt Lake City, and Las Vegas. If we leave it to the computer, have we created the perfect pilot, or could human error creep in another way? The old adage says it's the pilot who's always first on the scene of an accident. But in a pilotless aeroplane, the fault may lie with a software designer who is busy sipping his gin and tonic at home in Silicon Valley at the exact time your plane comes down in the Rockies. We'd like to thank you for flying with us today. I hope you can just sit back and relax and have a pleasant flight.